We salute you in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are happy to be here. I want us to go straight to the scriptures. Are you in the church triumphant? Amen. This is important. Uh, the song is really, really good. It's just going to go together with uh, it's going to go together with uh, our subject matter today. Amen. Last Sunday we were speaking on some of these things. We can't just finish them in one service, but uh, we 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 just showed that uh, in heaven there are chambers, in heaven there are regions, and different places. Taking the three courts of God to feed in all the people who are going to get in the kingdom of God. And we just want to, the same thought, because we've been in the book of Genesis, and we are going there today. And then uh, our scripture last Sunday of Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, is also going to come in play. And then we are going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to 4. I want us to begin. We tie these things together by the grace of God. I believe God will be gracious to all of you, grant you the understanding. Amen. Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. Something great has taken place here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. It says, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. Chapter 2, verse 25, says something else. Verse 25 says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Something has taken place in chapter 3 that has taken away that robe. That garment has disappeared. So our message today is the return of the robe that Adam lost. We can't talk of restoration and redemption unless the condition he was in in chapter 2, where he was naked, is very interesting. Him and his wife, they were naked, but they were not ashamed. But something has taken place in Genesis chapter 3 verse 10, he's ashamed now. Naked and ashamed. But naked, but he's still a child of God. Something has to take place. Then this one will send us to the book of Genesis, uh, Revelation, to see another naked people again. I know some of you want to write very, very fast on uh, uh, Revelation chapter 3. When I said about that, that the Bible says, And you are naked, and thou knowest it not. I do what? I command thee to come and purchase a garment or a raiment that your nakedness may be covered. But I'm, I'm going to Revelation 6, verse 9. And when, when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. It goes to show they were naked. But there were souls crying to God, but they were naked. We are also seeing another couple in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, also naked. And then we are finding in Revelation, they were also naked. And then we come to an age or a church called Laodicea, they are also naked. Then the Bible says there, and white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, that's your word, Father. We call upon you to minister the same to us. We love you, Heavenly Father. We invite you, Lord God. We bless you in the name of Father. Bless your people again today. In whichever place, whichever media they are using, to tap in, to in today, Father. Minister to them, O oh Father, even their needs. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, when you gave the children of Israel the lamb, when they came out, when they ate of it, everything that needed was in that lamb. Their shoes never grew old. There was none that was weak among them because the provision that you gave them for the journey was enough up to the promised land. And Heavenly Father, we believe the same today. You've given us your word, Father, and whatever that we need 
is locked in this word, Father. May you open those chambers, oh Father, and show us our spiritual condition and what we need to do, Lord. And Heavenly Father, we are not going back to heaven naked. Something has to be done to our lives, Lord. May we know the station where the garment, the robe, the apparel, the raiment comes upon us, Lord God. And may we know all the areas in our life that needs to be clothed. And we are standing here, Father, to know that you are providing these things. We thank you. We invite you, Lord. May your word, Father, go in greatness, Father. Father, in profoundness, Lord, that your people will understand it's you talking to them, Lord. It's not a person or Father. A person is only a conduit passing what you want your people to understand. We also bless you, Lord God. Those who've lost their loved ones, Father, Father, may you come for them this morning. We appreciate you, Heavenly Father. May you heal and touch us, Lord. Those who are sick in our midst and those who are connected to us and are sick, Father, you are still Jehovah Rapha. May you touch and heal each one of them in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want us to go again to uh, 1 Corinthians to tie this together. Oh, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians will bring you again to John 14 too. So we may be having two thoughts that we are going to connect together. And it's Paul that is taking us this way. We didn't want to go that, but Paul is telling us when you talk about this garment, you must talk about something else. He links them together. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.1 For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed. He's now using the word cloth. So the cloth and the house is the same thing. These are two words used for the same thing. So in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Paul had garments when he was talking about this nakedness. But he was talking about if he lacked this kind of clothing, he'll be naked. And the kind of clothing he's talking about is the one that is eternal in heaven. And he's talking about that. And then he says, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So you're talking about a garment of mortality. He's spoken about two garments there. He spoke about one that is in heaven and he's speaking about another one where this immortal, this mortality will be swallowed and will put on immortality. Those are two garments he has already spoken about. There is one in heaven and the other one is not telling us where it is. But he's telling us we are desiring to be clothed with immortality. Amen. You may be seated. We want to cover a few things here, God helping us. The return of the robe that Adam lost is our message today. And uh, we, we've seen in the book of Revelation chapter 6, it is, the Bible tells us when the fifth seal was opened, it revealed a people that were connected to God, but yet naked. And we want to look at the condition that was the people that were in the Old Testament. Were they clothed or they were not clothed? Do we have a chamber in the house of God where the robes or the garment are stored for the people in the kingdom? And how do we access this place? Now, we realize when Job is speaking about himself, talking about the nakedness of Adam, we realize Adam was naked, and all the children that came out of Adam and Eve were naked. That's why Job is saying in Job chapter 1, verse 2, he says, naked, came I in the world, naked, I will leave the world. Something had not been revealed to Job that we are not supposed to live naked. Because if we live naked, we'll not strike the presence of God. And when Adam sinned and Eve the Bible tells us very clearly they were naked and they didn't know it. So I'm wondering what kind of nakedness was this where someone is naked and he doesn't know that he's naked. And then we find in the book of Revelation there is there are also people who are naked and also they do not know. So there is something that God is playing here with words 
The Bible is showing us the nakedness. And um, so when we are dealing with the, the coming down of that robe that Adam lost, praise the Lord. It is coming back to clothe a human being. Something left Adam and Adam had to go and hide himself. And the thing that left Adam was not so much about the outside covering. What left Adam was the inner covering that left him. And what didn't left him, the outside could not even stand in the presence of God. So the outside nakedness was basically revealing an inner nakedness. That's why Paul is saying, we are desiring to be clothed, not to be found naked. Then we find in the book of Revelation 16, 15, it says, Blessed is that he keepeth his garment, that his nakedness will not be seen. He's not talking about the outside nakedness. He's talking about the family of Adam that came to the earth without a garment. Praise the Lord. When, when Job is talking about, when Job is talking and saying, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked and he shall return. He is not saying he was born naked naturally, and then he's going to be buried naked. He doesn't mean that. Because no one, the children of Israel had garments that was for the dead people. So Job was not talking about, I came naked naturally, like a child is born naked. And then when he's going to die, he's also going to leave this earth without cloth. He was talking about something that left humanity. And the thing that left humanity is found in Genesis chapter 2 is found in Genesis chapter 3 where it addresses this kind of nakedness. If we go again in, um, in Revelation 16, 15, it says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. He is not talking about the nakedness of the outside. This one is being used to show there is a shame of the nakedness of the inner man. A person could be a child of God, but yet naked. Because Adam and Eve were naked, yet the children of God. We are seeing again in, uh, we are seeing again in Revelation, souls that were connected to God, but they were in a place in the chamber, they were in a place in the, in the tabernacle, that they could not and had not accessed a place of garment. And this was the condition of the people in the entire Old Testament. The entire Old Testament, now this, are, before I say that, there are three areas in a human being that are the areas of clothing, areas of a garment. That is the body, the spirit, and the soul, or sometimes used interchangeably, the body, the soul, and the spirit. But let us stay with our subject matter. The body had a nakedness. We see it. That's why we put on garments. But the spirit also has a form of a nakedness. And then the soul also has a nakedness. God has put a human being in these three categories to function in the things of God. So there are three garments that the Bible is talking about. Just like, for example, you would talk maybe someone has a vest. Then he has a shirt, like for example, I have a vest, I have a shirt, and I have a coat. I've got three garments that are covering me. In one body. Praise the Lord. And God, this natural thing is showing us. And the human being became naked when they took of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the holy veil, the soul remained bare. The spirit remained bare. And the body remained bare. And they were running because they needed a covering. And the Bible goes ahead and says... And God clothed Adam and Eve. He slew a lamb, took the skins of a lamb, and covered them. But the covering of this lamb, hallelujah, did not cover the inner man. It covered the outside man. And this man, when he realized he was naked, he ran and went and took the covering of the, the, the botany life, took the leaves, and covered his nakedness. But the nakedness he got from the tree could not even cover him long enough. Because with the sun, the leaves would dry up. But with the skin, 
The skin would cover this outside man and the man would stay with the cover around him all the time. Oh, praise the Lord. But there is another man right inside that is supposed to be covered. So if God brought a lamb and then out of the lamb, he got a cover for the nakedness of a man. And the man was actually confident to stand before everyone. But this kind of a man cannot stand before God. Cannot stand before the angels because he's naked. And the shame of the outside body cannot be compared to the shame of the spirit of a man. The shame of the spirit or the soul of a man. That's what the Bible says. And the souls under the altar were naked. And you can even get the kind of language they're using. These are the people who are the children of God, no doubt. But these people have not been clothed in the soul. It is showing that there is a garment that must clothe that soul. There is a garment that must clothe that spirit. And God, in the book of uh, Genesis, when he's showing us that God slew a lamb to bring a covering, he's giving us a glue on where to find the garment for the soul. And that's when John comes in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 29. He says, behold, the lamb of God. And this lamb of God is not the same lamb that was in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis from which Adam got their garments from a clo or clothed by God was a type and a figure of another lamb. So this lamb is not going to provide for the normal apparel. It's going to go right inside a human being and clothe the soul and clothe the spirit and clothe the outside body. Because the garment we are putting on does not necessarily represent what God has in store in his wardrobe. God has a wardrobe also. And people must get to the wardrobe. Hallelujah. God must, you must get to the wardrobe. Someone is in charge of the wardrobe of God. And he's going to open to clothe you so that your nakedness can be covered because we are vulnerable. People are very keen putting on a garment. For the outside body. But they are not aware of the nakedness of the spirit. They are not aware of the nakedness of the soul. And they do not understand there is a chamber. Where God has stored these places. Where you can go and be clothed. And walk before God. Walk before man without fear. Because the garment is back. And the garment has to return. Adam is not saved. Adam, his family is not saved until the garment comes to clothe that soul. Until the garment comes to clothe that spirit. Until the garment comes to clothe that body. Because these are the three areas that require a garment or a raiment. And the people are very keen. Today you find people walking with a white. You know, there is no reflection. I'm looking for a white one too. They're walking with a white. But this white outside here is showing there is a naked inside. The reason why people are ashamed to walk naked on the streets. But there is another nakedness. You cannot stand, hallelujah, before the angel. You cannot stand before God. Adam could not stand. He had to run. And we see the fall of Lucifer, as we said in the previous message. His garment was also stripped of the garment. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 28, the Bible goes down to describe the garment that this Lucifer was dressed in. It talks about the precious stones. Hallelujah. It was a garment that the devil. Or rather not the devil. Before he became the devil. The garment that Lucifer was clothed in. Adam was also clothed. Even the serpent. Because there was a change. A body is a cover. It changed the way he was walking. It changed the way he was relating. Because there was a change in his garment. He was given the garment of reptile. A serpent was given the garment of a snake. It fell. And Lucifer was disembodied. And Adam lost the garment. They all lost. But I want to tell you, God says, there is a garment to clothe your soul. There is a garment to clothe your spirit. There is a garment to clothe your body. And this is going to bring a boldness. The Bible says we are going to appear before God. We are going to appear before God clothed in the spirit. Clothed in the soul and clothed outside the body. Praise the Lord. And the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 28. All the precious stones and music and the tablets were found in these men. 
And when the man, Lucifer, fell, he got disembodied. And when he got disembodied, he is now looking for a garment. The devil is also naked. Satan is naked. He wants to come and hide in a human body. But the body is trying to hide in. He's also naked. So we have got two people who are having relationship. They are all naked. One has no garment, so the other one is trying to comfort another one. I'm in the same condition you are in. You are in the same condition. Satan is in. Satan does not have a garment. A son of God also does not have a garment. A sinner does not have a garment. But there is a provision coming from the Lamb of God. The same Lamb that God slew to cover the nakedness of Adam. There is a Lamb for the children of God. And the Lamb is going to provide a garment, a raiment that we can stand boldly. Oh, hallelujah. That's what you are doing by the grace of God. That we are going to get the garment to clothe us. Because the garment were withdrawn from all the rims. The garment of the soul, the innermost. The garment of the spirit. Well, I'm not dealing with whether Adam had the other garment, but I'm dealing with you. There are three garments of God. If Adam was fully clothed, I will only just go a little bit out. If he was fully clothed with the outside body that you, God is going to clothe you, he wouldn't have fallen. Praise the Lord. So Adam being naked, it is because there was a man that he came and did something to them. And this took away the garment of Adam. But God must bring back that garment. And I want to say this. The word naked in Greek in Strong's comes from the word arom or aram. A-R-O-M A-R-A-M Either arom or aram. And that word means subtle, crafty and cunning. The same word used to describe the serpent is the same word that is used to describe the condition of the person that was deceived by the serpent. He came and possessed Thank you. The spiritual condition of this man. So Adam was a Rome. And that word a Rome also means the serpent. That word a Rome means the serpent. That word a Rome means subtle. Something crafty. Something gunning. And he came to Adam. And Adam partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he possessed a nature in him. It was a condition that was Adam was in. A condition that said you cannot even appear before God. Praise the Lord. Now, so there has to be someone coming to pay for the nakedness of Adam. Someone has to come. And when this person, I just want to show you something here. When this man called Jesus Christ comes, he came because there was a promise. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Adam had committed sin and the laws of God had to be kept. And God gave a promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God is going to give a seed to the woman. And this seed is going to do something to the serpent. He's going to bruise the serpent's head and the serpent is supposed to bruise his heel. This is going to be a struggle so that the garment can redound to these people. That the garment can come and God is going to reveal how the garments are going to come down to these people. That we could be clothed again. That the shame has been taken away. Now this word nakedness talks about even a city. A city that has got no walls around it. It is bare. It's naked. It talks about people that don't have the word. They're also naked. It is used in the Bible. That even God made Judah naked in the days of King Ahaz. Ahaz. It became naked. There was no protection. You are open to any other kind of a thing. But the garment is supposed to protect. It's a fortress. It's a defense around you. And God is showing us. I want us to go a little bit deeper as we move on. We cannot today possess the spiritual condition of the serpent. We cannot possess a Rome today. Every person on the earth today is a Rome. A Rome means naked. A Rome means crafty. A Rome means the serpent. 
And there are people on earth today that are at home. Don't say roaming, okay. Maybe that sounds good. But there are people who are possessing the spiritual condition of this man. But there is another man. And this man, when he came to the earth, he had a garment in his spirit. He had a garment in his soul. And he had a garment in his body. There was a chamber that came to the earth where the garments are supposed to be stored. Where am I getting this? I'm going to show you in 2 Chronicles 22 and 2 Kings chapter 22. The keeper of the wardrobe. The person that makes sure we are clothed inside because Paul is saying, I'm desiring to be clothed with my house from above. Amen. Praise the Lord. John chapter 20, verse 7, verse 5, 7 up to 15. Jesus Christ, today I want to keep it short. Jesus Christ was crucified naked. Why am I saying so? Jesus, the Bible talks about the two types of garments that Jesus Christ had, and he was stripped of those garments. The Bible says there was one that was so precious, I want to say, and then the soldiers had to divide into four. They got to say, no, 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 this garment, <laughs> say this garment, you have to give me a piece, so they cut it into four, and one person received a piece, another one received a piece, and another one received a piece. So the first garment was gone. This was showing that the garment of this man is going to clothe some people. They didn't know what they were doing because they said, God forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. And then there was another garment that was more precious. This garment must have been precious, all of them. Because they said, we have to cut the garments. You get a piece, this one gets a piece, this one gets a piece, this one gets a piece. And then they discovered there was another garment that Jesus had. This garment was so precious, and they say, no, no, you have to cast lords. Amen? We have to cast lords. Whoever that this thing, if you are going to flip a coin, and the right flip side is the one who is going to take the garment. So it leaves Jesus naked. But Jesus Christ had proved that he had another garment apart from this garment. Praise the Lord. Left Jesus' garment uh, uh, naked. So we come to a man by the name Joseph of Arimathea in Luke chapter 23. So Joseph of Arimathea goes and takes his linen and wraps around Jesus. Not Christ. Christ has never been naked. He wrapped around the body of Jesus. He went to Pilate and requested. And he said, give me the body of Jesus. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And he had a tomb that no man had laid in there. So he took the body of Jesus Christ. Wrapped that body with a napkin. And went and buried that body. When he buried that body. In the resurrection morning. We are trying to find out which garment is this. That Adam must have worn. I can't explain how this happened. Then the Bible says Jesus Christ, when Mary went into the Sibaka, and Simon and Peter were running together with John, and John outran Simon. Simon and Peter never entered the Sibaka, but John went right inside. When he entered inside, he found the same garment that Jesus' body was wrapped in was folding. Like someone just stepped out. He just stepped out like this and left the garment. Then verse 15, he comes to Mary and tells Mary, Woman, why we best thou? So the question would be, what garment had Jesus? He left the natural garment that he had because he never needed it. He had another garment that Adam had lost. Amen? He had now a glorified body, praise the Lord. And this glorified body, Jesus Christ, had first of all stepped in that body in Matthew 17. When Jesus Christ was transfigured, he moved from the natural body, hallelujah, and stepped into another body which was a garment. Now the body and the garment is the same thing as it's written in 2 Corinthians 15 verse 1 to 4. The body and the garment is the same. 
And Paul is desiring to be clothed with a house. He calls it a house. He calls it a tabernacle because he calls this body a tabernacle too. He says, if this earthly tabernacle be dissolved, we have another one in heaven, eternal. And then he said, we desire to be clothed, which means you are clothed with your own body. You are clothed with a body. You are also clothed. Praise the Lord. So this garment that you're supposed to be clothed with, Jesus Christ manifested those garments on earth. He is the lamb is not going to give you one garment. He must give you three garments. Somewhere in the house of God, there must be a place where the garments are stored. So Jesus on Mount Transfiguration, what does he do? He tells the disciples, uh, 1628, there are people that are living that are among you who are alive that not partake of death until they partake, they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Then after six days, Jesus goes. He takes James, Peter, and John, and was transfigured. Something emanated <laughs> from inside and took over the body. So he didn't like drop a body. He didn't like remove like I'm removing my coat. No, 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 no. Something broke right from within, consumed the outside body, and there he was. And the people were not even covered in the spirit and the soul. They could not stand. Simon, Peter, James, and John were like the souls under the altar. Children of God, but not with a garment. So they are looking at this man in this condition. They cannot bear that glory because of the nakedness of the soul. The nakedness of the spirit. But Jesus Christ gives them a promise. In John chapter 14, in my father's house are many mansions. Mansions are bodies. But now bodies, according to 2 Corinthians 5, is also a garment. So in my, my father's house are many garments. There is a garment for the spirit. There is a garment for the soul. There is a garment for the body. And he says, if it was not so, I would have told you. And Jesus manifested these three garments while he was here on earth. He talked about some. Hallelujah. In the book of Matthew, the Bible says, he said, do not despise these little ones. We connect that to Matthew. Chapter 18, verse 10. Is it 10, 18 or 18, 10? 18, 10. He says, for I tell you, do not despise this one, for I tell you, they are angels. Always behold the face of the Father that is in heaven. The angel that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 18, 10 is the same one he's talking about in John chapter 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. So what he's calling angel here is called a mansion here. Amen? And then that's what Paul is also coming to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2. He's calling it a tabernacle. And he calls it eternal. If there is a house eternal, it means it's not something like something that is lifeless. Now this is something you are dealing with the dimension. You are alive here. And your body is eternal. Which means there's some form of life in it. But where are you? You are living in this body. But you cannot connect to that other body or that other house or that other garment if you don't have the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost comes down to clothe the soul. And when the soul has been clothed, it connects to the theophany. And when the theophany, when you get in the theophany, you are connected to the glorified body. So these are the three bodies that are coming down for a destitute son of Adam that was born naked. So we have got three garments. Hallelujah. We have got the garment for the soul. What is the garment for the soul? The baptism of the Holy Ghost. What is the garment for the spirit? The theophany. What is the garment for the body? Glorified body. A child of God is dressed from inside out. But the first garment that you must have. You as soul. Am I doing going fast? Yes, 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 yes. The garment that must first of all drop. It must be the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It must come so that you come out of the brazen altar. Where you are saying, I'm a soul. I'm a child of God. I'm predestinated. Even if I leave this house, 
if you leave this place, you will go to the, the soul under the altar, a naked place. That person is a bitter man, we said last Sunday. He's a man that is asking for revenge. He's a person that has never come to a place where he can forgive and let go. It is because the condition of this man is living in is a soul, a seed, a jam of God that has not been quickened by the Holy Ghost. Now that helps us. It helps us to say, you can't just say, hey, I don't care. I don't care the kind of life I live here. If I was a child of God, if I die, God, no, no, no. We are talking about champions. We are talking about places in heaven. We are talking about even some people. We are talking even the mystery of the Gibeonites. Let me not go there. The Gibeonites are not going to be destroyed. They are going to get hooked on the children of God who are going to Canaan. And they are going to be workers there, yet in Canaan, but they don't have inheritance. They are only workers in that place. We don't want to be a worker there. You want to have a possession that Jesus gave you. I'm avoiding not to go to the Kibunites, the mystery of the Kibunites. How they come in when God told the children of Israel, go and never enter into a league or a covenant with the nations you find in Canaan. Destroyed all of them because Leviticus 18 tells us the kind of people the Canaanites were. You know the word Canaan means a merchant. And they were doing business in everything, that, even with their bodies. Bestiality was there, lesbianism or homosexuality, it was right there. You can read it in Leviticus 18. The Bible says, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do this. And the things I've mentioned were mentioned by God. And God said, for this, the nation that I've drove away from you did these things and God judged them. Then among these people, there was a people called the Kibionite. The Kibionite realized we cannot fight these people. Hallelujah. They say we can only enter into a covenant. And once a covenant has been sealed, God becomes the custodian of the covenant. You cannot break a promise. You cannot break a pledge. You cannot, pro you cannot vow something and you fail to fulfill it. A covenant is a strong thing. A covenant, the word covenant comes from the word bereath. It means to walk through dead sacrifices. Because a covenant was done when the sacrifices were split into two. And you and the person you are making a covenant, you stood in between, you passed in between. And you told your partner that if you don't fulfill the part of the pact, you'll be like this animal. And you'll also tell you the same thing. So the Kibionites come with all type of bread. With the torn shoes, very tired, and they are coming in in a very subtle way. They are coming and say, "Brothers, we've heard how you've uh, that is in Joshua chapter nine. We've heard how you've killed and overcome the king of Sion and the king of Og. These were the kings of the Amorites. The cup of the iniquity of the Amorites was supposed to be full. That's what God told Abraham. He told Abraham the Amorites' cup of iniquity has to be full." Before your children come out. And the Amorite was the head of the tribes in Canaan. And it had two kings. Sihon and Og. So when the children of Israel are coming out. They have defeated Sihon and Og. The kings of the Amorites. And that gives Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh inheritance on the other side of Canaan. When they are crossing there is a people that are saying we want to come in. Then they're saying, now can you just look at us? And Joshua looks at them. He says, okay. So you, you, are, you are calling for a space. We want to be servants here. We are not going to fight you. And the Kibionites get in the land. And when they get into the land, Joshua discovers later on that these people were actually the next neighbors. And he called them and he told them, what have you done to us? And the elders were a wrath. They were wroth with Joshua. Joshua said, there is nothing we can do. You, we've already entered a covenant with these people. They are now a part of us. That was a special place for these people. They could not claim promises. That's why we are talking about heaven is a place of chambers and regions. We want to partake of everything and be a full son. You want to have a garment in your soul. Garment in your spirit. A garment in your body to be a complete son of God in the stature of Christ. The Bible says as he was, so are we in this world. And the Bible says we shall be like him. 
You must be like him in the spirit. You must be like him in the soul. You must be like him in the body. He's now in a glorified body. You must partake of everything. Don't come around with the revelation of Akibionite. Akibion looked for a space. But when it comes to the time of returning to inheritance in the year of Jubilee, Akibionite could not return. Because Akibionite was not a servant, Akibionite was like a slave. And I want to tell you there was a difference between a slave and a servant. The word servant means a man who has lost his inheritance. We were not slave to sin, we were servant to sin. And the word servant means a time and a season will come for you to go back to your inheritance. But a slave could not. You had no inheritance. You had no nothing. You could, be, you could be living among the children of Israel. But your place is not the same. This is what helps. Don't come with a Kibionite kind of revelation. Then, then it became so hard. Then Joseph said, okay, if that's the case, you are cast forever. You shall only be cutters of wood in the house of God. And the Kibion are saying, praise the Lord. So long as I can bring something in the house of the Lord, I don't care about my inheritance. The house of the Lord will make sure I eat because they will see I'm working. If we read Deuteronomy 15 or Exodus, I don't remember the scripture, it talks about the year of Jubilee. They have the book of Exodus. The year of Jubilee, if you've been a servant under servitude for 49 years, it didn't matter the time you fell into bondage. But the 50th year when it came, the trumpet of the Jubilee blew. I can't get into that right now because something is opening up. When the trumpet of the Jubilee blows, people are going to leave where they were working. And God is so gracious in the Bible. He talks about the death of the high priest. The death of the high priest was also a liberty for the people who are locked in the cities of refuge. Those who are in Golan, those who are in Beza, those who are in Kadesh, those who are in Hebron, those who are in Shechem, those who are in Ramoth Gilead. When they had the high priest has died, you empty from the place where you are, you are going back to inheritance. The same thing in the 50th year when the trumpet blew. On the 50th year, on the day of atonement, wherever you are, you went back to your inheritance. But the Gideonite had no inheritance because the land was for Abraham and Abraham's seed. It goes to show even in the kingdom of God, we are going to have people that do not have the same stature, the same category, the same glory like you do have. But a child of God wants to partake of everything that God is. Give him a hand clap. Amen. If someone says those, those clubs are very few. Yeah, the baby, there are very few people here today. Praise the Lord. The Cubanite come around. And then there was a man by the name Saul. He mistreated the Cubanites. After mistreating the Cubanites, then Saul died. After Saul dying, God plagued Israel. For three years, they never had rain. There was dust in the land. There was drought and famine. And people didn't know what to do. So David goes. Praise the Lord. He goes before God. Before you remind to him. And asks. What is happening? And God reveals. It is the way you people have treated the Gibeonites. People you enter into a covenant with. Treat them with the decorum. Treat them right. God is going to defend. Whenever you enter. And that's why we have got a problem. People breaking promises. You do not know God is a custodian of a covenant. You will die. It takes blood to be shed to bring back a person who has broken a covenant. And that's why when Adam broke the covenant, Jesus had to shed blood to bring Adam back to the original condition he was in. Young girl, young man is breaking a promise. I'm going to marry. It doesn't happen. You come to a place, be very careful. Covenant, God... The Bible says God is the one who comes to mediate. Covenant, once you make a covenant, it becomes God's property. It becomes like a spoken word that God has spoken. God wants you to fulfill it. You cannot mistreat a person that you have a covenant with. Let me leave that part alone. That's what it is. So there was famine in the land and David goes to ask, what are we going to do? Then David is told, the Kibionites. So what does David do? David walks to the Kibionites to ask for forgiveness. 
And the Kibinites knows how the covenant operates because they had already been trapped by a covenant. Covenant traps, promises traps people, vows traps people. Be very careful. Fulfill all you have promised. If it is God, if it's a human being, fulfill. Pay your debts. You know, it becomes something very scary when someone tells you, uh, okay, that one, you know, you don't have to pay. That is dangerous. Honor the word that comes out of your mouth. So the Kibionites understood. They stood and said, hey, what are you saying? You are saying, David is saying, forgive us. And the Kibionites say, no, blood has to be shed. Because when you enter into a covenant, a blood has to be shed. And when the blood is shed, to bring you back to the original condition, blood has to be shed too. That's why the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. Why was he shed? To bring a man who had broken a covenant back to the original condition. It was, that's why Jesus says, this is the blood of my covenant. It is another covenant to establish the privileges and the right that were lost when the covenant was broken. Praise the Lord. Then we find, it's very clear, we find the Kibionites are telling David, do this. The person who has caused us to be in this condition, we want his sons killed. So there was the wife of Saul called Rispa. They had to bring seven sons of Saul. And the seven sons of Saul were killed. And blood was shed. So that the rain could come back in the land. I want to say when you broke our covenant too. Jesus Christ shed the blood. Amen. So the rain could come back. It will take a covenant again to reestablish the privileges of the previous covenant. But I want to tell you, when the sons of Saul were being killed, there was another son by the name Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth's Mephibosheth, son was the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul. And David had already entered a covenant with Jonathan. And Jonathan had told David, when you, when you ascend on the throne, remember my house. And there was a covenant that David entered in the covenant. And David called for Mephibosheth to come and leave. When the dad was killing the children of Saul, there was a man that was reserved by the name Mephibosheth. Because of a covenant, he could not cross over. I want to say, death cannot touch you if the father has made a covenant with Jesus. Jonathan is Jesus. David is a child of God that has entered in a covenant to preserve you. And that's why you will be alive today. You will go through all the process because you are here. I shall fulfill it because you are a child of Mephibosheth. Do you, Do you understand? I just I just had to go there to show you how it how was it was hard. How the how the came in. They did not they did not come in under the great the of Israel. They did not they did not come in under the power of the Lord of Abraham. Come out of your land and I will give you another land. They did not come in under the privileges that this land belongs belongs to God. They did not give the privileges of God to thy inheritance. They are they are not in the They were so sovereign. We can not have the sovereign. We are the sovereign. Of God. By the time, time we would open to us in, uh, in uh, or, or, you know, Matthew 25, five, talking about, talking about a people among, among the nations that are going to be in the millennium and not be born again. again. But they have a service to the people of God. And the people of God are the ones of God. The people of God are the ones of God. That's what the nations are the ones of God. The way they keep natural is well. God is going to make them cross all in the millennium. They are not getting it because they were saved. They got it because they ministered to these people at the time of their needs. You too. If someone ministers to you, you will never lose the reward. These are the people who are not coming in under the new path. They are coming in under what's brother. We are also getting in under what's but not our works. The works of the Lord Jesus Christ that you connect by faith. You understand? Can you imagine there when it, the Bible talks about the book of Matthew chapter 25, it talks about people who are almost losing eternal life. But they are only held into that life by giving someone a cup of cold water. They are held in that life by visiting one in the hospital. By visiting another one in the prison house. There is a time of persecution coming upon the earth. And the people are going to suffer. But that will be an opportunity for someone to show the works of God. 
There's a time someone is going to reach out to the one in the hospital, one in the prison house, one that doesn't have a shoe, one that doesn't have a garment. There are people are, that are just, the Bible calls them rushers. They are going to minister. When they minister to this group of people, the Bible says Jesus will tell them, enter into the kingdom prepared for you. That is not the you and me. You must come in under the original purpose of God's salvation for man. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Be baptized in his name. And then get the three garments for your soul, your spirit, and the body. What is our message? The return of the robe that Adam lost. Are we together so far? So we understand by the things we've shared here. We understand the people in the Old Testament did not have the robe for their soul. They were the children of God true. Like any other sinner today in the world. He's a child of God. That may be true. But he's a child of God not by the new birth. He's a child of God by predestination. Now, I want you to understand this. You could write down if you're writing. A child of God by predestination, you are in the mind of God a germ of life. A seed of God. A child of God by the new birth means that seed has been birthed by the water. By the spirit that came from Jesus Christ when he was crucified. So you are not going to be a child of God by predestination only. You have to be a child of God by both predestination, new birth, and adoption. These are stages of sons of God. A son of God that was none of God in the mind of God. And then the son of God comes to a place, he gets new birth, new birth he gets born again. He's a child of God by experiencing the ginosko, epiginosko. We say the epiginosko means experiential knowledge. Because nosko is knowledge. But epiginosko is experiential knowledge. It's a knowledge you get by experience. When you are a child of God, by predestination, by a foreknowledge and election, because you are there. Then when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you become a, a, a beginosko son of God. You've experienced the sonship. But that is only the first stage. And after you've experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there is no pleasure in the world like the pleasure of receiving the Holy Ghost. There is nothing in the world that can be compared to a person that has just been born again. There is something great because the garment has come down, hallelujah, and the glory is soul. But tell me, why do we have testimonies that people have crossed off on the other side? They are telling you, let me not go back. You can even read books about the people who have crossed over. They're talking about their near-death experiences. They say, why have you come to awaken me? People are feeling good because they have left this body. They have ended in another pleasurable body. That's why Eden means a land of pleasure. But it was not a pleasure the devil has taken. It was a pleasure in the spirit, a pleasure in the soul, a pleasure everywhere. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Hallelujah. What is happening right here? The person, some of the people have left this earth. You remember Brother Bram giving a testimony of his wife. That the wife was in some place. When you talk about chambers, let me throw in something there. She was in a place and then she told him, Don't you worry so much about me. Her sister was telling me last week, she was worried about her mother. But she saw the mother and the mother's face was glittering. The mother passed on. Was one of the believers here. And then the mother said, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay where I am. Oh, praise the Lord. I want to be right when I get there. When I exit the body, if I have to exit the body, I want all to be well with my soul, well with my spirit, well with my body. Then you find, she says, she tells Brother Branham, don't worry, I'm good. Don't worry about me. You've spoken about this place, but you've never been here. Someone is telling you there is a place. Some of the people have gone and have tested a little bit of it. They say, I don't want to go. And then they are told, no, you have to go. Your work is not yet done. Hallelujah. We have to know what is it that Lazarus did when Jesus Christ called him back. Jesus was not calling Lazarus just for him to come and Jesus to show. There was a work that Lazarus had to do. Lazarus was a scribe. There is something he needed to write and was exiting the life before Jesus. God does not preserve you for nothing. There is a work that you have to do for the kingdom. Okay. Praise the Lord. Then the Bible tells us in the book of St. John. Okay, that's preaching. That's not teaching. St. John says, and then Jesus Christ left the body. 
Amen. When he left the body, I'm looking at my time. I said, I'll take one hour. It's already one hour. Let me just have some 30 minutes here. Jesus Christ left the body. No, left the garment. Christ left the body in the grave. When he came back, he glorified the body and he left the garment. And then he appears to Mary. So the question is, you know, there is so much that John did not write. That's why John comes around and says, if what Jesus Christ did all was written, there would be no place for it. That is also one of the things that John did not write. If he was to write, he would have told you which kind of body was this that Jesus entered in and he left the natural garment. Amen? Do you understand? It was not a natural body. It's the body that Jesus had shown them when he was at transfiguration. Do you know, they cannot even explain, they don't have vocabulary. That's why Mark says he ended and his garments were so white that even there is no, there is no fuller or dry cleaner or adobe to wash it to that level. It was the brightness that Jesus had stepped in. He already stepped in that body that he's going to give and he had to show those bodies. At the Mount Transfiguration, he showed those who will not die. That Paul says, we shall not all die, but we shall be changed. But he decided never to go into the rapture at the Mount Transfiguration. He decided to come back and that body, the body that he saw or the garment that he wore, went back into where it stayed. Amen? Then when Jesus Christ died, stepped in that body again, but by resurrection. So he had stepped in the body by translation in, on Mount Transfiguration. Then at the resurrection, he's stepping in the body by resurrection. Now it goes to show there are people that will step in the body by transfiguration. To transfigure means to move from one figure to another. From one body to another. And that these people will live to see the coming of the Lord. And I want to say they are going to step into this body. And there are others that are not going to step in the body by translation. They will be resurrected. Jesus was showing that I'm going to give all of you garments for your body. If you are alive, I'm going to give you a garment. If you are asleep in Christ, I'm going to give you a garment. Oh, praise the Lord. The Bible says, blessed is he that he keepeth and watcheth. He keepeth his garment because there is a place we have to get the garment. Let me, let me get to, to a place. I'm not going to take so much time. Uh, the return of this garment. Let me go slowly. In the Old Testament, people never had that garment. That's why when the witch of Endor called for Samuel, the only way she could describe Samuel, it was by the garment that he used to wear on earth. You say, did you see him? Yeah. Uh, there's uh, gods rising from the ground. And how is he dressed? Dressed like this with a garment long and everything. Oh, that must be Samuel. These are the people that had not entered into. The first clothing that God wants to clothe a person is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. People in the Old Testament, let me talk about the Holy Spirit for a while. Because we are finding people under the brass and altar that do not have the garment of their souls. Yet they are souls. So we see being a soul, being a child of God, being a seed of God is not all. That is a child of God by predestination. But God has brought something through the blood of Jesus to give you to make you a son of God by experience, by a new birth. To make you into a new creature. So you are not going to worship God. I'm worshiping God because I was there. No, no, no. I want to worship God because I was there. Amen. But I want to worship God because God has given me an experience to prove I was there. If there is no experience in my soul that I was there, how am I going to worship God? You are finding a person here, bitter. Saying, when are you going to avenge? That, let me say this, that was the condition of the people from Adam. In the Old Testament of them, they never had the Holy Ghost. Let me say this, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament did not abide, did not dwell among the people. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament came as an inspiration, came as a visitation. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell. 
We are not working because an inspiration came upon us. We are working because inside of us lives another person. And the Bible said the name of that city shall be called. The Lord is there. But God had said in Exodus 25, make the people, give, let the people give gifts. Make a tabernacle that I may dwell among them. That was the desire of God to people to, to live among the people. But he could not use those bodies. The bodies were defiled because they were born under the program of the tree of knowledge of evil, the knowledge of good and evil. And the devil could claim the bodies. But there had to be another body the devil cannot claim. The devil even claimed the body of Moses. Can you imagine? It had to take Michael to rebuke him. It goes to show the believers of the Old Testament who are predestinated children of God, but are not children of God by experience. But the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, makes you a child of God by experience and that it makes you connect the two experiences in your life. When you receive the Holy Ghost, if you exit this body, you will go to another body. Pleasurable body. But I want to tell you there is another pleasure after the theophany, the glorified body. Jesus said, I overcome all. There is a body that, the garment of your soul, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The garment of your spirit, the theophanic body. And then the garment of your body, the glorified body. But who are you? You are not a body out. You are not a theophany. You are the germ, the very life of God. Because you say God shared his own life with only two people. Him and you, not the angels. Angels live eternally, but they don't have the same form of life. Your life is higher than the angel's life because your life is the life of God himself. And that life had two, bo three bodies or three garments. I, want to, I don't want to say three in that sense, but the three, but because this one is not going to be a different, he is going to be glorified. There is something great going to take place on this body. This body is not going to be a replacement. God says, oh my God. He's going to give you a new body, but not a new body that this one is going to be done away with. It is going to be transfigured. Enter into another form. Parere komai. Parere komai means going to pass from one condition to another. It's going to pass from this condition to another condition. And God has got something for this body. It is when the body is going to move here and step in another body. It will be God providing the rope that Adam lost, bringing it down. And in every age that the people lived, that garment kept on coming down to the people. There was a larger that was uh, that uh, Elisha asked for a good thing. Elisha came to uh, Elijah came to Elisha and asked Elisha, "What can I do before I leave?" Say, "Give me a double portion of your spirit." But it's not a double portion; it's a double anointing. It's a double portion of anointing because this is not reincarnation. If you say it was the same spirit of a large man, you are dealing with the reincarnation. It is not that kind of a thing. It's the anointing, the power. That's the Bible says John will walk in the power of the spirit of Elijah. It is the power that was being doubled. It's not the spirit coming back in that sense of the word. Then Elijah told Elisha, if you see me, go. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Elisha tells, Elijah tells Elisha, if you see me, go. So this man is looking for a garment. So he knows the garment is not going to come down at Gilgal. He is told to wait at Gilgal. He says, no, I'm not going to leave you. Then Elijah tries to discourage a person looking for a garment. He says, no, you can't make it. He goes to Bethel. He meets some sons of the prophets. He still goes. What is he doing? I'm going for the garment. Then he goes past Jericho. Then we reach Jordan. Then the pillar of fire, or rather the Bible says the chariot of fire comes and parts them. This one steps into translation. Just like Jesus Christ walked with John, Peter, and James. And he also stepped into translation. Stepped into the body. And Elijah also stepped. I want to tell you, we could be walking together through of us. And one of us is designated for translation. He will step in the body where you are and you'll be left. Then he stepped in, and then the garment came down. Then when the garment came down, the Bible says he tore his own garment and put on another garment. That garment has always come down since Jesus Christ died. Up to 2021, the garment has been dropping down to the people. 
Amen. That the people can be clothed all the time. That garment is returning in the power. Bring you back to Genesis 1.26. The return of that robe. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, we're about to finish. You allow me to finish this. So people in the Old Testament, God never gave them the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was like an inspiration. Sometimes people are very moody. So you have to sing a song. Get a guitar and sing a song. Huh? Hallelujah, Yesu, Aoko, Aoko. And then the Spirit comes. When the Spirit comes, maybe to Jehaziel. And then the Jehaziel prophesies. And then the Spirit leaves again. The man is with the temper. The man is whatever that he has. Because God has not come to abide. But God had to look for a time when he abides in you forever. He had to become Christ to say, I will never leave you. I will stay with you. He that keepeth my commandment, I and my father will come and make an abode. There was no abode for God in the Old Testament. That's why they never had the Holy Ghost. That's why I'm saying they never had a garment for the soul. And that's why you can see all these people right there and the brass and altar. You are not a person for the brass and altar. Don't say I'm a child of God by predestination. I'm a child of God by experience. Here is Jehoshaphat. They're going. It's a time of crisis. And then they don't know what to do. They're saying, let's go and inquire from Elisha, their prophet. But the prophet did not have a presence of God abiding. Because God could not abide in the Old Testament. God says, my spirit can never strive with the spirit of man. So the Old Testament was a time of striving. God striving with the spirit of man. But after Jesus died, gave you a new nature, a new life, there should never be a strife between you and the spirit of God. The spirit of God must come to abide. Where is the place of my rest? God wanted to come and live. God wanted to come and live among the people. Because that was his original plan. He had never revealed to Adam, not to Noah, not to Eno, but to Moses. When Moses went up, in, Gen in Exodus chapter 25, say, go and make down there, make a dwelling place, a pattern, like the one you've seen, and let them build a place for me that I may dwell among them. God was looking for a place because God does not have a right to operate on earth. He doesn't have a body. When he created Adam, that was a body that God could use to operate. But when Adam committed sin, that body could no longer be the body of God. And all the children of God could never be God's children for God to operate in. But God is going to purchase a body. That whatever that he wants to do, he can use your body, whoever you are, to do it. Because now God becomes legal. You've made him legal. You've made God powerful by accepting him. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Brothers, these things are real. So Elisha, there is a time of uh, crisis. It's a time of war. And then they found Elisha. Seated somewhere, and Joshua goes with Ahab. And Elisha could use very strong words. There was a time one of the sons of the king went to ask him. He told him, go and ask the gods of your mother. You know that's when in Swahili is very tough. He told him, go to the gods of your mother. That looks to be very bad. Because Elisha was a very moody man. So when they came one morning, they also found him moody. So he said, I cannot operate because the spirit of God does not deal with, dwell in me by birth. He dwells in me. He comes over me by visitation. Brother, you don't want to come here to sing, to feel the spirit. You don't want to come here to hear the inspired message to feel the spirit. That is important. But you want to come here when the word is spoken. The Holy Spirit right inside of you is awakened and starts charging you. Like that old man that came in one of the meetings of Brother Branham. And then he was being held to the pulpit. And uh, he was taken to the pulpit. He, didn't, he couldn't stand. And then he told the believers, you people are talking about what God did when he created the world. But I'm reading from the book of Job chapter 38. Where were you? And the man kicked. And the man jumped. And he went down. To the sins straight because there was something dwelling in the man in the man to charge the body. And I'm telling you, the presence of the Lord in your life will heal you, will restore you, redeem you, and change your life because God has come to abide. Why am I reading that? That is St. John chapter 14, where Jesus talked about in my father's house, our many mansion says, I will ask the Father to give you another comforter that will abide with you forever. Jesus, you know, Christ did not want to leave the earth. 
And that's why I keep on saying, and I will say until it gets saturated in the souls of the people. We are not waiting for Christ. Christ will meet him at the altar. We are waiting for Jesus. Jesus left the earth in Acts chapter 1. And the angel said, the same Jesus you've seen go shall come in like manner. But Christ remained behind to dwell in you, to give you the desire of your heart, to judge your body, to heal you, to give you the Holy Ghost, to give you all the needs you need on earth. Christ is present. The power of Christ is present. Because he has found a dwelling place. When Stephen in chapter 7 of the book of Acts, I'm coming to my place now. He says, how babe? The most high Solomon built him a temple. How big the most high God does not build, live in the house made of human hands. He's looking for a body. When he comes in the world, he looks for a body. Why is he looking for a body? What house will you build me? He wants to live in a body to abide. Brother, just have to awaken him. I want to remember this place when there was a storm on the sea. And thank God in that boat there was Jesus. And then the brothers were trying to remove the water, removing the water. And someone, one of them told him, friends, we can't do this forever. Inside this body is Jesus. And someone went to Jesus and awakened Jesus from within. Call Jesus on the scene. Awaken him from within your life. He's not going to come from somewhere. He's going to come from within you. We are talking of a great time. If I wasn't saved, I would be on the altar saying, God help me. There is a great time that is coming. Oh man, the Bible says in the book of Daniel chapter 10, when Daniel saw him, he says his body was made of burial, some stones. It is the glories of these bodies. It's not just like a body, <coughs> like a garment. Chapter 10 says, this man, when he appeared to Daniel, he had a mo the most, they, they could only compare with the most precious stone. Jeremiah 31, God says, and I will adorn you. Then the Bible says, and I saw the bride, and she was adorned, she was clothed. Does this say so? Come, I show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And I saw the new Jerusalem coming down like a bride adorned. Oh God, there is my adorning of the spirit, adorning of the soul, adorning of the body. When she was seen, she looked like the city. She looked like this transparent gold. She was like a pearl. And she was to look upon like sardine and jasper stone. All the precious stones were put upon this body. When you talk about glorification, you're talking about precious stones. And that's only the language we are dealing with. We are not talking about something that can be destroyed. We are talking about a character. We are talking about many things. Those stones are characters. Those stones are response. All those stones are attitude. These are the things that God wants to call the people. God doesn't want to work outside of his people. We are coming to the last scripture here. But before we do it, so the man had to take a guitar. He says, bring me a trimble. That's the only way I can call in the spirit. I want to tell you people don't call. You find people are excited when the music is going on in the church. When the word is going on, they're sleeping. I want to tell you these are the souls under the altar. That spirit has not been born again. It, that soul is empty. It does not have a cloth. It doesn't have a garment. He has to go to church to remind himself he's a Christian. He has to do this. But I want to tell you a Christian is inside out. It is the Christ that has come to abide. Christ could not abide in the Old Testament. Their bodies were not purchased. But Jesus on the cross purchased a body. Breathe on that body. Say so receive the Holy Spirit. And from that time Christ came that he can perform. Let me tell you. If you are someone tell you the things that are happening today have never happened before. He's not telling the truth. The Bible says nothing is new under the sun. God has been working from the day of Pentecost. From the time the Holy Spirit came up to 2021. God is dealing with the people. There is this spiritual pride that makes you think, now we are alone, we are the people, you are making a serious mistake. You are tying the hands of God only loose in this age. You are wrong. God has been working with the people from the time he came to purchase the body. He said, I will never leave you. But you are making God, you are making Christ living. In the day of Pentecost, he came. Then he left. Then he has come in this age. You are not telling us the truth. We know how God works. He said, I will never leave you. Nor forsake you. I'll make you my abode. Elisha, it's a time to make him resident. A place where God can reside. A place, a station where God can move and do things. Praise the Lord. People in the Old Testament, they're in a problem. In the book of Chronicles chapter 22 or there. 
or maybe Second Kings or wherever. There is Jehoshaphat. They have been attacked by the three nations. They are going to the church, to the temple to pray with the children. They are praying there. While they are praying, they don't know what to do. Then the spirit came on Jehaziel. It was not an abiding spirit. It was an inspiration that he came to address a situation. After the prophecy was done, that spirit left. Then Solomon, he's coming and they're singing in the temple. And while they're singing in the temple, you know what happens? The presence of the Lord comes. It was one of the greatest times of the Old Testament. But I want to tell you, when God came in the Old Testament in the tabernacle, in the days of Moses, in Exodus chapter 40, and then he also came in the temple in the days of Solomon in the temple, then he promises he will come again in the second temple, cannot be compared to the baptism of the Holy Ghost that came in the day of Pentecost. That one came and left. Even the book of Ezekiel says, and I saw the glory of the Lord living. It left the tabernacle, left the holy place where he was between the cherubims. Hallelujah. He left and stood on the court, stood at the east of Jerusalem and went up to heaven. It was now Ichabod. The glory had left, but God is going to bring a people on earth with an abiding glory forever. I will never leave you. I'll abide. I will live with you forever. In the day of Pentecost brings a description about God because you are born with a price. Your body is in the temple of the living God. God can come in that temple and live in. I want to tell you, we are talking about the return of that robe. The return of the presence of the Lord. In the name of that place shall be called the Lord is there. You cannot abide in the place of the brazen altar. Where when the seals were open, when the fifth seal was open, I saw the souls under the altar. You cannot even stay at the brazen lever. Brother, I'm telling you, you exit this life. You go to the altar of innocence where the elect, and those are compartments, chambers. But you are alive, you are living under the candlesticks. You are watching the table of the shoe bread. You are watching when that trumpet sounds. And the, 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 when the trumpet sounds and the places where people were hiding are emptying out, I'm going to be emptied from this body. I'm going to cross over. Those who are dead at the brass and altar, the, the altar of innocent, are going to be emptied out. And we are going to meet at the table and we shall meet the Lord forever. I want to tell you there is something that God is doing in your heart today. He's empowering you by revealing to you your purpose and destiny in life. We are not waiting for a song, brother. We are waiting for something more. No. When he comes to come to dwell, he comes to indwell. When you go to work, he's there. When you are going through a problem, he doesn't prove his absence. It doesn't matter what you are dealing with. I will abide with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you always to the end of the world. What is the coming of the Lord Jesus? It is Christ in you, rising you up to meet Jesus in the sky. There is an emptying coming out. There are people emptying from the altar of incense. And we people from the altar of innocence, they are going to be resurrected from the, the, from the candlesticks where we've been hiding. Today we are right there with our body full of the oil of God, the Holy Spirit of God. When God cries with us, the trump of God, they are going to be emptied. We are going to be emptied. We shall meet the Lord in the air, the table of the shoe bread. And we shall have that marriage of the Lamb. And something will also be happening down here on earth. A great gospel is going to be preached. And that gospel is different. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. We need to get into the study for that. We are under the gospel of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is Acts chapter 20. It's called the gospel of the grace. But the children of Israel are coming in under the gospel of the kingdom. And that gospel was suspended. And then another gospel was opened. Another mystery was revealed. And a man went and revealed a secret that was on the backside of the mind of God. A secret that had never been uncovered. And that secret, let me say shortly, is a church. Read Ephesians 3. Read Colossians 1, 24, 25. You will show this is a secret that was never known. But the kingdom was known to the children of Israel. But us, we were hidden. And apostolic ministry, it came forth. And the gospel of grace is going to end somewhere. And then the gospel of the kingdom will be preached on earth. Praise the Lord. We are not standing here saying, God, 
That brother sang a song until I felt like I'm being raptured. I would rather love the word of God is being preached until God is confirming to me what kind of a person I am. Let me say, let's read our last scripture here as we get to a close. We are going to 2 Kings chapter 22 verse 14 or we are going to 2 Chronicles chapter 34 verse 22. You can get the same thing. 2 Chronicles chapter 22 verse 14. I'm just going to take one word there that will help us. Second, uh, okay, Second Chronicles. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I think I want, I want Kings. Not Chronicles, I want Kings. Uh, Second Kings, chapter 20, is it chapter 22? Yeah, praise the Lord. Chapter 22, verse 14. Second King 22, verse 14. Let me just say something because we want to end here. During this time, there were three prophets on the land at that time under a king called Josiah. Josiah was uh, a son of, I think, Ammon. Ammon was the son of Manasseh, or I'm missing them out, and they were all children of Ezekiah. Ezekiah, I want to tell you, Ezekiah was a man without a child. When God comes to tell him, put your house in order, he wanted Ezekiah to ask something from him. The house in order, Ezekiah did not have a child at that time. And the 15 years was a time when a child was going to be born to continue the lineage of the Messiah. If Ezekiah died, if Ezekiah never looked at God through the, the word of God, he would have said, I'm going to die. But if he died, that would have been the, the, the lineage of the Messiah would have ended there. But Ezekiah lived 15 years. He asked God. The put in order was to ask the lineage of the Messiah. And a child was born, and another child was born, and then Josiah was born. And from there, the lineage of the Messiah was kept. So God can do so much to achieve so much. So people say Ezekiah backslid. I'm not telling Ezekiah backslid. To me, Ezekiah did the right thing. He asked the right prayer. Within the 15 years, a child was born and became the king in Israel. And that child came to an, And even these children who were born were very evil children. They were sacrificing their children to Molech. But then Josiah came in the time of a great revival. There was no king that turned his heart to God like Ezekiah and Josiah. So during this time, they started repairing the temple. When they, re they repaired the temple, the Bible tells us they discover a book that was lost. The book of the law was discovered when they were repairing the temple. That means a lot. That is 2 Kings chapter 22 verse 8. It talks about the book that was discovered. But it comes and gives another part of the story. Verse 14 says, So Hilkiah the priest, and Ahikam and Akaba, and Shaphan and Asaiah, went to Hulda the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, or Shalom if we wanted. The wife of Shalom, the son of Dikva, the son of Haggas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they communed with her. This woman called Hulda was a prophetess. But her husband was the keeper of the wardrobe. Can we finish there? A place where garments are kept. Don't you think we need to meet Shalom? A man that keeps the robe for your soul, for your spirit, for your body. Look at that little word that God puts there. He just say, and Shalom the keeper of the wardrobe. In the kingdom, there had to be that chamber where vestments, raiment, apparel of different types were kept. Josiah had that kind of a chamber. Listen to me. If you follow that even in the temple, there were different garments in the temple. This was God showing us also in his house. There is a place where the chambers are kept. When Adam lost the robe, they were kept somewhere. Are we together? And then these robes were kept under the custody of another man. This man was responsible of the garments or the robes or the vestment. And that same chamber is where the treasure, most valuable treasures of the king were kept. It was under the custody of this man. And this man understood all the occasions and the garment that needs to be worn. <laughs> Hallelujah. He knows when you are born again, the new the baptism of the Holy Ghost. 
He knows when you exit this body, you are going into the glorify. You are going into the theophany. He knows when there is a resurrection, there is a garment that the keeper of the wardrobe is going to supply to you. May he supply that garment to you today that you can walk in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Or oh, the Bible tells us in the book of Esther chapter 6. I've got many scriptures here. I'm finishing. The Bible said there was a man by the name of Mordecai. And Mordecai had done something. And the book is also associated with this. Hallelujah. And Mordecai had done something to save the king. And the man had not been honored. And the Bible said the king did not sleep that night. And then he said, bring the book of Chronicles. Bring that lamb's book of life. Bring the book where names are written. And the book was brought. And when the king opened the book, they found the name Mordecai. Mordecai was supposed to die the same morning. Haman had already made the colors to kill Mordecai. But Mordecai is going to live by the virtue of what he did. And I want to tell you there is something we did too. We believed Jesus. Because our works is not our works like the book of James. Our works is what Jesus did. And this person was waiting. And then Ahasuerus, the king could not sleep. He found the name and asked the people, what honor has been done to such a man who saved the king when two people wanted to kill him? And they say nothing has been done. He says, "What? who's standing there? There was a man there, hallelujah. The man there by the name who? Haman was standing with the colors to bring death. I want to tell you the time you are receiving this garment of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is because somewhere there is a Haman standing with the colors to kill you. But I want to tell you because your name is found in the book. You cannot die. You are not going to be clothed. Hallelujah. Because your name was found in the book. There is no calling of the names. It is happening through the most gracious thing that God ever gave man. The preaching of the gospel is calling the people to be clothed. Then Mordecai. Mordecai was not expecting it. He did not realize it was a time for the reward. And then he said we are standing there. Haman is standing there. And then Haman is called. Can you give us your view? What is your opinion? About a man that God delights in. And this devil thought. God delights in him. I want to tell you things have changed in the kingdom. There is now another man that the king delights in. Amen. That is my beloved son in whom I am well placed. There is another man on earth today. And that is supposed to be you. The man that God, the, God, the king delights in. He says... And then this man thinks, ah, is there another pan that kings delights in? Except Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Akakite, the Akai from the tribe of the Amalekite, Amalek, the, the son of Elphaz, Elphaz, the son of Esau, Esau, the persecutor of Jacob. Then he thinks he's going to get his now. What, what's supposed to be like? He said, this. He's supposed to be clothed. Number one, hallelujah. Number two, he's supposed to be made to ride on the horse. That the king rides in. And let another person go three things. Another person declare him. That shall be done to the man that the king delights in. You are the beloved bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then there is a garment. Then there is a horse which is a power. Then you are riding. And there is a horse declaring. That is a child of God. That place was in Ahasuerus kingdom. A place where the garment were kept for honorable occasions. It is honorable for you to repent. It is honorable for you to confess of your sins. It's honorable for God to come with a garment and rub your soul. It's an honorable thing when you exit this life. Because the Bible says God delights in the death of his saints. Precious in the sight of God. Because it's an honorable thing in the garment. In the, in the, in the kingdom of God. There is a garment ready to clothe that soul, that spirit. And then you are waiting there. Waiting for another day of coronation. When you shall come down on Revelation chapter 19. Riding on a horse. That is the return of Mordecai. That is the return of Mordecai with a white garment. And he's riding on a horse. And the whole of heaven is following you. There was such a place. As you come to a close. Those places were chambers. A prodigal son, when he was coming home, he would say, give him one of the precious garments. He was clothed. Paul calls it a garment. Shalom. The husband of this woman. This woman comes to reveal the word. You know how she revealed the word? The Bible says, when the book was opened to Josiah, the place where it was opened, it was a place of judgment. Because judgment is what saves you. Judgment must be preached before mercy is presented. No one will rise for mercy if there is no judgment preached. So when the book opened, 
Even Abraham himself started in the seeding for Lord when God opened to him the judgment time. When God opens with you the judgment time, he is actually helping you to rise for mercy. He wants to give you mercy, but you cannot get mercy unless judgment has been preached. As we come to a close. So when the book was open, Josiah asks, wow, take this book to Hulda. Hulda means a weasel, a burrowing animal that goes for those small things. You know, get those details about yourself. He comes to give the interpretation and tells Josiah, the person who has sent you, Tell him the thing that I written in that book are going to take place. And then Josiah rends his cloth. When he rends his cloth, the word comes again from the woman. She says, mercy has now been given. This thing will not happen to you because you have humbled yourself. Then the Bible goes down and says this woman, which is a prophetess, she was married to a man who was the keeper of the wardrobe. He is the church. Could that be the husband of this church? Could that be the husband of the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ? That he keeps the wardrobe. I want to tell you the chamber came down. The chamber that has got all the garment and the vestment for glorification. Garments for the new birth. Garment for translation. And garment for glorification. They were all in Jesus. And at Calvary, the chamber was open. Amen? Then Simon Peter was given the keys. Then the keys were used in the book of Acts chapter 2. He opened, then the garment dropped to the people, 3,000. Then in chapter 3, chapter 4, garment dropped to the people, 5,000. Amen? Then in chapter 8, Simon Peter came and opened the Holy Spirit to the Samaritan. The garment came down like it came from Elijah. It's coming from the Lord Jesus Christ, coming to the people. In the book of Acts, garment came down. Today it's coming down because the chamber has come. It is in the kingdom of God. A place where the wardrobe are kept. Shalom is the Lord Jesus. Or Shalom is the Lord Jesus Christ. And his wife is a married man. Amen? He's a married man. He has entered into a union with the elect of God. That's what God is doing today. That's the rope that Adam lost descending back to the people. In the Old Testament, there was no Holy Spirit as a person abiding. It was a power that helped the people to perform certain things. Make people to translate, move from place to place. Speak in a certain way and all that. But I want to tell you in the New Testament, after the price was paid, he abides. He can do everything. That's why Paul stands and says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. If the same spirit that was in Christ is in you, he shall quicken your mortal body. Where the children of God today, the garments are set. You are partaking of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you exist this life, you are moving. I'm just wondering, a friend I met last week, I've just gotten the information this morning, she passed on. She's a daughter of a, a wife of another bishop in this town. Sister to Brother Abner, and your sister Masi. I met Evelyn last week. Just got the information, she's passed on. We are just trying to say this. If a child of God exists in this life, there is a coronation. There is a garment that God puts you. I want to tell you today, People can come here. You don't have to die to get that garment. You can get one garment while you are alive. If you leave this place without that garment, you can't get it right there. They were given that garment because these were the children of Israel that did not believe in Jesus Christ. As the Bible says, they died for the testimony of the word of God, not the testimony of Jesus. If it was the testimony of Jesus, they wouldn't have cried for revenge. They would have cried like Stephen, Father, forgive them. Because Stephen had a garment in his soul. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. We don't have bitterness. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, your word is true and it's amen, Father. How we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for being available to us, Lord. Father, helping us to know there is a wardrobe that has been opened, Father. To clothe your children, that garment, oh, Father, that today we can stand and say we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. We are not running away from the presence of God because we have a garment. Father, the garment has come down, Father, as the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You purchased it for us, Lord God, and you've given it to us, Father. And the Bible says, and the bride was given, Father, white garment, white linen, which is the righteousness of the saints. Father, Sakrai chapter 3 says the same thing. Sakrai had a position. He was a priest, but the garments were filthy, Lord. But, oh God, you stood there, and the devil was wanting, oh, stood there to accuse him. But the Bible was very clear. It says, God... Say, let a garment 
Let him be clothed with a new garment. Father, we want to thank you there is such a place in the kingdom of God. A place where the vestments are kept for your people. Oh, Father, we understand these people. Oh, God, there is a relationship between the prophet and the keeper of the wardrobe. There is a prophet, there, 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 there is a relationship between the Lord Jesus, the Pope in the Holy Spirit, oh God. Oh, Father, the person that keeps, give the gifts to men. All the nine gifts, the, the nine fruits of the Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Ghost. The orphanly glorified body because all power has been given to me. Even the keys of death and life is given to this man. Oh, Father, we thank you for such a chamber in the kingdom of God that you can bless us and bless us, Lord, that we can stand dressed from within. Oh, God, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, remember, Lord Jesus Christ, oh, Father, your people. We are praying, Heavenly Father, you touch them and heal them today because of the purchase that was done by Calvary, Lord. The purchase that you did on Calvary, Lord, should feed all of us, oh, Father. We want to leave this place clothed, oh, God. As Paul said, I'm desiring to be clothed, oh, Father. But the greater desire, Lord, we want the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be relevant in our life, to be reside in our life, oh, God, that you may come and abide because you've revealed to us that the purpose of the sacred to have preeminence of Christ in the body of believers. We thank you any further for the return of the garment. The price has been paid. Jesus, you stood the nakedness of Adam. And even if Father, you've come to your people, Lord. You said, I'll never leave you. I'll abide with you forever. We thank you, Father. We bless your people, Lord. Those who are sick, Father, touch and heal them, Lord. Even those who are online watching over this media, Father, remember to bless each one of them, Lord. May they possess the gates of the enemy. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen.